secular Qur'an academics claim the Arabic Qur'an is not divine, but a cultural product of the Arabs, written by an Arab or Arabs somewhere in or around Arabia. The culture that produced the other great cultural product of the Arabs, Jahili poetry, also known as the Diwan al-Arab, archive of the Arabs, must have also produced the Qur'an. It's just common sense. If the source of both are the same, i.e. the Arab culture, surely the ontological worldview observed in the pre-Islamic poetry would be mirrored in the Qur'an, since much of the finest Arabic poetry was written in the preceding 6th century and in parallel with the Qur'an in the 7th, we ought to see a significant thematic overlap. That's just obvious. Evidence of conceptual borrowing between poetry and the Qur'an would indicate a common human origin, namely the cultural milieu of the Arabs. Therefore, the Qur'an isn't divine, but of human origin. So, what's the truth? Brothers and sisters, highly acclaimed secular professor Angelica Neweth, whom I've introduced you to in a previous video, will now demonstrate whether we find this historic literary and philosophical convergence. The professor is a world-leading German Islamic studies mm. scholar and professor of Quranic studies at Freie University in Berlin, also a visiting professor at the University of Jordan in Amman. Her research focuses on Quran studies, classical and modern Arabic literature, Arab late antiquity studies. She has taught at the universities of Munich, Amman, Bamberg and Cairo. Ideas put forward in these texts is, however, limited to their uh, particular milieu, which can be captured through an equally limited scope of literary genres. It's not at all surprising that the 6th century Arabs were interested in writing poetry about their immediate desert environment. Here are the themes and genres we find in their writings. Rock inscriptions, they are extremely short and mostly dedicated to private, mostly, ephemeral issues. The content of the other great source of early Arabic writing, rock inscriptions, are of the same intimate kind. Love, sickness, death and longing. Important to note is the almost total absence of discursive speech. There are no theological, legal or cultic debates in pre-Islamic poetry. Indeed, little theoretical thinking can be traced if we do not concede one important exception. There is arguably a serious philosophical interest lurking in the nasib. I'm going to underline this because it's important. Mm. Remember, she's describing pre-Islamic poetry here. Quote, the almost total absence of discursive speech. Mm. There are no theological, legal or cultic debates in pre-Islamic poetry. Indeed, little theoretical thinking can be traced. This she will next compare with the Qur'an, a book produced, supposedly, by the same ethno-linguistic group. It's a striking fact, then, that the Qur'an appears seemingly, seemingly, out of the void, as a full-fledged discursive text, extensive in range and replete with theological and philosophical queries. So, a complete 180. Where the poetry lacks these significant literary characteristics, the Qur'an is, quote, replete with theological and philosophical queries. Mm. So it's not surprising that... This ob observation has been vexing Western scholars for generations. The Qur'an's surprising richness of ideas and its consummate form. The striking disparity between the rudimentary Arabic poetry on the one hand and the richness of the Arab Qur'an on the other, in terms of its intellectual sophistication, is for academics understandably quite vexing. But recall, Angelica Neweth made an exception with the Naseeb. Now, this is where it gets deep and really interesting. The Naseeb. The poet's nostalgic lament on the site of the ruined encampment where he remembers a happy past in the company of his friends and his mistress. The Nasib is uniquely open to poetical introspection. 
Angelica Newith is describing the introductory nasib of the poems which are famously sad and always conjure the image of a ruined Bedouin encampment. The poet laments a happy but lost past with friends and the departure of his beloved. The message of the nasib is always, love and happiness is fleeting. Man is helpless before his fate. It is also in the nasib the poet will often introduce the audience to what should be a very familiar word to all Muslims, wahi, which in the poems is deployed as a powerful metaphor. In the context of Jahili poetry, it refers to a nonverbal sign or inexplicable graffiti on a desert rock. Some shapes in the poet's eyes represent not a valid sign system, uh, but an empty signifier, reflecting the devastated states, uh, state of the poet's past, of his encampment, which is erased to the ground. Writing then, represented by wahi in pre-Islamic poetry, is a kind of shorthand sign for the negation mm. of the validity and relevance of Muruwa, the Bedouin world view. Okay, so there's a lot to take in. Mm -hmm. Let's break it yeah. down. In these Jahili poems, the opening, the nasib, is always the same. The persona in the poem is observing a wahi, an enigmatic sign on rock, and feeling a profound despair. These mysterious graffiti represent the obliterated past and leave the poet feeling confused and pessimistic about his present and future existence. Symbolising, uh, quote, the permanence of nature mm -hmm. and the impermanence of culture. The poetic wahi, mm -hmm. i.e. the confusing rock inscriptions, represent an existential crisis facing the Bedouin. This is the disconcerting worldview of the pre-Islamic Arabs. Life is pointless, for all good things perish. It is also more striking then to find that this wahi of loss, mm. a wahi that remains mute, has been inverted in the Quranic lexicon. Wahi in the Quran denotes inspiration. It even successively acquires the meaning of revelation, ayat, signs, epistemic tools that disclose to the listener the hidden significance of his surrounding. The mute and foreboding wahi of poetry that left the poet depressed, signifying pessimism, has literally been flipped 180 in the Qur'an. The term wahi in the Qur'an is no longer a perplexing graffiti that throws the poet headlong into a poria. The negative wahi now signifies a positive sign, a revelation, inspiration. Subhanallah. So instead of the wahi mystifying life, the Quranic wahi re-enchants it by literally and symbolically descending as a revelation to unveil the secrets of the universe. This reimagined wahi rouses in the once beleaguered poet a newfound vitality and a sense of personal meaning for the arc of life. It is this perception of the world that the Quran addresses. God himself takes over the role of fate and reshapes the time of man, which no, is no longer cyclical but expands from primordial uh, creation to its end on Judgment Day. The Bedouin worldview is turned on its head. What was once willful fate annihilating culture and rampaging through civilization in poetry is replaced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. Whereas a Muslim is now able to shape his fate through the intentional act of worship and ritual dedication, deaf and mute fate, which doesn't respond to anybody, has been displaced by a listening and benevolent God. Death is no longer the end of everything you savor, what you do in life is judged and it determines your afterlife. You now have the promise of eternal bliss to help you find meaning in this life. Ultimately, the anthropocentric worldview has been displaced by a theocentric one. The individualistic, heroic, wine-drinking hedonism of Jahiliya has been supplanted by a God-centered theological system that now values discipline and personal accountability held inside a profound covenantal bond reaching into the annals of history. The Qur'an doesn't just hail a new moral vision and thereby 
an existential break from the past. It initiates a paradigm shift by directly challenging and turning the old ontological assumptions on their head. It's one thing to chart a new course, but to say to an entire civilization everything they knew for a thousand years is wrong, and the opposite is true, and the brazen way Allah does so, is just an astounding feat. Let's now get to the heart of the video. Are the people and culture who produced the Jali poetry also responsible for the 7th century Qur'an, therefore both are of human origin? The answer is a resounding no. Frankly, the worldview in the poetry and the Qur'an are diametrically opposed. In summary, the Qur'an has a positive message of hope. The signs and world reveal the purpose of life. You shape your own life. A final judgment. Your actions inform. An afterlife that depends on your actions. Whereas the pre-Islamic poetry has a depressing message of a pointless life. Signs on rocks are mute and confusing. Non-negotiable fate and not God controls life. No final judgment. No afterlife. So on account of this strong conceptual animosity, the only reasonable conclusion is the Qur'an could not have been a product of the Qasida-producing Arabs. It means that the Qur'an comes as a sudden disclosure in Arabic language of until then unspoken of or at least unattested discursive ideas. I propose to read the Qur'an as nothing less than the document of a cultural turn, an epistemic revolution. With words like sudden disclosure, unattested, until then unspoken, a cultural turn, an epistemic revolution, there is no doubt in Angelica Newith's mind the writing of the pre-Islamic Arabs and the writing in the Qur'an cannot be compared. Okay, so, if the masters of the Arabic lexicon didn't write the ultimate literary masterpiece in Arabic, the Qur'an, who on earth did? Well... There's a whole lot to take in. As a non-Muslim, I'm kind of... It's a whole information for me to just digest. I need to do a personal research on these terms. You know, terms, Wahi, and the other terms she mentioned. But you could see that the woman did a lot of research about the Quran. It's not just an ordinary book, a supernatural book. It's something that you really need to connect where to understand you know i don't know what to say guys because if i start to talk i might say nonsense so i don't know what to say as a non-muslim all i'll say is that i'll go and do my research on it and it was really nice getting this information so thank you so much for watching i enjoyed watching it thank you so much for watching don't forget to smash that subscribe button for more like share comment i'll see you in the next one bye